Hello everyone, welcome to A plus BI. This channel is all about complex numbers and in this video we're going to be solving an exponential equation with complex numbers. So we have square root of 2 to the power z equals negative 1. So we're looking for a complex number when square root of 2 is raised to that power will give us negative 1. What are complex numbers? Well, complex numbers can be written as z equals a plus bi. If you would like to see more details, you can go ahead and check out my lecture videos. If you're new to complex numbers, go ahead and check them out and let us know in the comment section if you have any questions. Now, I also have another channel that focuses on algebra number theory and trigonometry. That's actually my first channel, Cyber Math, Cyber with an S. Go ahead and check it out and let us know what you think. Now, to be able to solve an equation like this, we're going to use the polar form. But let me ask you some questions first. Can we square both sides? Why? You would probably ask, right? Because I want to get a positive one on the right-hand side. Think about it for a minute. Like, what would happen? Because as is, like, how do you get a negative number from a positive base? Is that possible with real numbers? Think about it. Is that possible with complex numbers? That's what we're going to explore. But let's go ahead and square both sides. That should give us square root of 2 to the power 2z, or not 2z, equals 1. Right, Because we squared both sides, now we have 1. Can we safely say that if z is equal to 0, then we get square root of 2 to the power 0 equals 1, so z equals 0 is a solution? Yes and no. Yes, z equals 0 is a solution to this equation. But that's not the same equation that we had. Because we squared both sides, and by squaring, we actually messed things really up, like big time. It, we introduced extraneous solutions. Extraneous solutions are solutions that are not solutions to the original equation, but that are solutions to the newly generated equation, which we found by squaring both sides. So, squaring both sides is not a good idea, but I just want to explore real quick, show you, because sometimes people can think, uh, you know, maybe to do something like that. Okay, the next approach is going to be, maybe we can just write the square root of 2 as 2 to the power 1 half, and then kind of write it as 2 to the power z equals negative 1, now we can go ahead and multiply these two. 2 to the power z over 2 equals negative 1. But again, we run into the same problem. How do you get a negative 1 from a positive base? Let me answer that question right now. It is possible with complex numbers. Thanks to Euler, we have something called a polar form of a complex number. Let's go ahead and talk about that. And we're going to apply it to this equation in, you know, different ways. So... If you have a complex number in the complex plane, which is also called the argon plane, let's say our number is z equals a plus bi. Of course, uh, z is represented by a point. This is called the real axis. This is called the imaginary axis. And the whole thing is called the argon plane. It's just how it's spelled. People think that sometimes it's the d is silent, but that's not the case. As far as I know, I think that's a French guy. So if you go ahead and connect this to the origin, that'll give you the distance from zero. Right? Obviously, that is considered the absolute value of our complex number, which can also be written as r, which is also called the modulus. And of course, an angle is formed in the positive direction, which is theta. And from here, we can write z also as r times e to the i theta. Again, r is the modulus or the absolute value, and theta is the argument. So you need to have two pieces of information. But how do you graph or plot z equals a plus bi, easy. Just like a point a comma b, right? And in the first quadrant, things are a little easier, but that's basically a point with two coordinates. And if b is zero, then you have a real number. If a is zero, you have an imaginary number, and then you have everything else in between, right? In this case, we have negative one, so we gotta be careful. Negative one is gonna be a real number, so it's gonna be right here, and its distance from zero is obviously gonna be one unit but the argument is going to be pi radians. Of course, pi is just the principal argument, or is it not? Maybe the negative pi is the principal. I can't remember. I think one of them is included. I think it's negative pi, and pi is not. But anyways, something like this. And you're allowed to add multiples of 2 pi, because if you just add 2 pi to this, it's going to bring you to the po same point. Or if you subtract, it's over and over to the same point. So that's why when we write theta, we could sometimes replace theta with theta plus 2 pi n, which adds multiples of 2 pi. But we consider theta to be the principal argument, which is the smallest angle between negative pi and pi. I think negative pi is included, but pi isn't. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's something like this. Okay? 
Great. Let's go ahead and see how we can do it to, neg do it to negative 1. Negative 1 can then be written as 1 times e to the power i times pi. But again, we're going to go ahead and add multiples of 2 pi to it. So we can write it in a more general form. How about negative 2? I mean square root of 2, sorry. Square root of 2 is also real, but it's on the positive side. And it's modulus because it's a real number. Its absolute value is its absolute value, which is the square root of 2 times e to the power i times 2 pi n. You could also write this as 0 plus 2 pi n, but instead of that, you can just write 2 pi n. The reason why it's 0 is because root 2 would be something like this, and obviously the angle that it makes is 0 radians, or you can add multiples of 2 pi. But in order not to use the same integer, maybe we can call that 2 pi k, so now we can write this as e times 2 pi k. So we have everything we need, we have all the ingredients we can go ahead and cook, right? Let's go ahead and do it. So, we're going to raise this number, the square root of 2, to the power z, right? And that will give us negative 1, which is 1 times e to the power i times pi plus 2 pi n. At this point, you're probably thinking, some people might be thinking, okay, when we, took, uh, when we look at the moduli, like the absolute values, we don't seem to get an agreement. Because if you think about it, and sometimes people get stuck on this, but we don't have one on the right-hand side. That's the good thing. If we had one, then this would kind of be meaningless, and the only solution would be z equals 0, right? But with the case of negative 1, we can find some solutions, don't you think? And here's how it works. Well, people object to this because they say, okay, if you look at the absolute value of the left-hand side, you get the square root of 2 to a power z, so something like this, right? And then we have the negative 1 absolute value of that to the power nothing. But this can't be happening because this is 1. How can square root of 2 to the power something have an absolute value of 1? So let's go ahead and explore and see how we can make this work. Okay, great. So I don't know why that happens. Uh, oops. Okay, I think it's good now. Sometimes notability acts weird. But anyways, so let's go ahead and uh, work this out. What should we do next? The best... I think the way to approach it is instead of distributing the z inside, why don't we just natural log both sides? That's going to give us z, because you're going to bring it down, times ln root 2 times e to the power i times 2 pi k. I guess I don't need parentheses. Equals ln e to the power, we can go ahead and clean this area now, uh, i times pi plus 2 pi n. k and n are integers, by the way. Did I forget to say that? I probably did not. But from here, you can basically uh, isolate z by way of division. But what is ln e to the power something? It's that thing, right? So this is what the answer is. A here, though, we have the ln of a product. So we kind of need to separate them. So let's go ahead and separate first. And then we're going to go ahead and divide. This is going to be 2 pi, oops, 2 pi ki. And then equals i times pi plus 2 pi n. And finally, we can go ahead and divide both sides to get z. It's going to be i times pi plus 2 pi n divided by ln root 2 plus 2 pi ki. But here's a million dollar question. Do we really need, do we really need both of these integers, n and k? Here's what you can do first of all. Suppose n and k are both 0, so we kind of try to get the simplest solution out of this, and that will be z equals i times pi divided by ln root 2, right? And ln root 2 can actually be written as 1 half of ln 2 because uh, root 2 is 2 to the power 1 half. So when you divide i pi by that, you're going to get this uh, in the simplest form, 2 i pi divided by ln 2. So when I show you the results from Wolfram Alpha, I want you to compare this result to what Wolfram Alpha could find. But this should be the general solution. Now, here's another question. Do we really need both n and k? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section down below. So let's go ahead and take a look at what Wolfram Alpha has to offer for this problem. All right? And, well, actually, I think I forgot to include. Sorry about that. Wolfram Alpha uh, provided some answer, but you can look it up easily, right? Okay. And this brings us... Till the end of this video, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.